This session starts with images of a nature which may cause distress to the viewer. Discretion is advised. Hello, my name is Faisal Trey Shah. I'm a street photographer and photojournalism enthusiast. Welcome to my workshop in getting started in street and documentary photography. And I want to kick this off by having you think about any news article. Just think about it for a moment, whether it might have been something you read about online, you might have watched it on TV, or you might have read about it in the papers. Just think about that story for a moment. Now, whilst you're thinking about that story, I'm going to ask you this one question. Would you believe that had happened if there were no supporting images or videos for that story? And the answer is most likely no. Because if it wasn't for supporting images or video, you wouldn't have believed that Grenfell Tower had burnt down across 24 floors for 60 hours as a result of council negligence with fire safety and health risks from improper cladding, which as a result ended up claiming over 70 lives. You wouldn't have believed in the tank man, who repeatedly shifted his position in front of a row of tanks that attempted to get past him amidst protesting in Tiananmen Square. You wouldn't have believed that there are young women in Iran that are disguising themselves as men as there were restrictions of female fans from entering football stadiums. You wouldn't have believed that Russian ambassador Andrei Karlov was assassinated by an off-duty Turkish police officer in an art gallery. You wouldn't believe that Mexican families such as mother and daughter Sandra and Yanela Sanchez were criminally prosecuted for seeking asylum in the United States, leaving poor Yanela Sanchez to be one of the many immigrant children that were separated from their parents. This is photojournalism, the sacred art of documenting worldly historic events both in suffering and in strength with photographs and it is perhaps the most important type of photography that you can choose to do. With photojournalism and the nature of storytelling within it, it plays an integral role in making the reportage of events believable for readers to comprehend. With photography, it encapsulates the notion that seeing is believing, but with photojournalism, it also emphasizes the importance that believing is seeing. Some of the leading names in photojournalism that you can open up a tab right now and start Googling right away would be David Gussenfelder. One of his standouts for me was his work on the impact of dioxin, found in the deadly chemical weapon Agent Orange. American planes had sprayed over 20 million gallons of this poisonous compound across Vietnam to obliterate their land, only to find that it also causes multiple cancers, birth defects, and other severe conditions up to this day, three generations later. Steve McCurry. Arguably one of the most famous photojournalists ever, his portraits around the globe reveal just how stunningly beautiful the world and its people are. Joey Lawrence. He's released a book called We Came From Fire that showcased the two years that he spent in Kurdish regions in Iraq and Syria documenting the volunteer fighters of the PKK and the YPG in the fight against ISIS. Mark Peterson who's been making continuous work in his photo study, which he calls political theater, of the ongoing ever dramatic unfoldings of the US political chaos in real time. And finally, Sol Loeb, who had most recently made outstanding documentation of the outrageous breaking of the US Capitol, organized by America's 45th president, Donald Trump, who had claimed that the 2020 election had allegedly been stolen from him. Ultimately, this led to him receiving a permanent ban on Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch and Twitter for inciting violence, as well as possibly receiving a second impeachment at the time of this recording. If this impeachment goes ahead, he will be the first American president in history to be impeached twice. I have to be honest, with photojournalism, I didn't know I wanted to do it until I saw a car on fire outside of my house. When this was happening, I was already doing street photography and I was already enjoying the thrill of taking stories with pictures. But I saw that car on fire and I just felt a compulsion to go out there and photograph it. So I, I don't know what it was, but I just felt this nagging feeling in my head like I gotta go out and shoot it. I gotta go out and photograph it. So I got my camera. I went out at like three o'clock in the morning and I started photographing the thing on fire. By then, firemen had came through and they started putting, it, putting out the, the, um, 
the, the fire and they were just putting it out whilst I was just out here just photographing the whole thing. The firemen didn't seem to mind. I don't know why. But all of it just seemed really interesting. There was chaos, there was action, and it just felt necessary to document. I was photographing it in real time. The owner of the car was looking at the chaos through his doorway. Poor guy, lost a car as a result of it, but hey, at least he's got car insurance, right? And then it started snowing as well, and it was just an amazing mixture of hot and cold with chaos and order trying to be brought towards the madness. It was an insane scene. Pretty sure a number of people were looking through their windows as well, but to get up there close, photograph it, feel the heat from the fire and everything, that really made me feel alive. And after going through all those pictures and editing them and seeing the story unfold through this visual narrative, that was the day I realized that I want to be a photojournalist and I want to go out there documenting these crazy scenes, these horrific scenes as well, and report the story out there to the world. And that's basically how I ended up getting into photojournalism. One of the more interesting things that I documented, however, was this Hindu festival called Ratha Yatra, or the Chariot Festival. This was a really interesting event and I saw so many different scenes, which I'll let the photos do the talking here, but it definitely stood out to me as being a very unique cultural tradition that is outside of something that I'm familiar with. And it really opened my eyes and made me realize that these are things that happen all over the world, let alone just in the heart of London. And although I haven't really traveled yet to different countries to do photojournalism internationally, it really made me realize that there are so many happenings like this all across the world that are a display of faith or culture. And it's just so beautiful to see people so in belief of these things and practice them. To date, the most recent thing that I have documented was India's celebration against Pakistan in the Cricket World Cup 2019. India versus Pakistan is regarded as one of the most intense sport rivalries in sporting history because of the partition that took place in Hindustan in 1947. With a deep, painful, rooted history behind India and Pakistan and the sporting rivalries, it's no wonder why Indian fans went out in full force to celebrate the win against their Pakistan all day long. So what does photojournalism require? Well, let's go back to the first five photojournalism examples that I showed you earlier. Have a look at these and think about what all of these have in common. Take a moment to think about it. The answer is that they were all shot in honest means in accordance of the photojournalism code of ethics. And you might be wondering what those code of ethics are. Well, I'm going to show you. One, be accurate and comprehensive in the representation of subjects. Ensuring that your images directly correspond to the moment at hand. Two, resist being manipulated by staged photo opportunities. By remembering that you are the writer of this visual narrative and remembering that it is your responsibility to portray the story as close to the honest truth as possible. Three, be complete and provide context when photographing or recording subjects. Avoid stereotyping individuals and groups. Recognize and work to avoid presenting one's own biases in the work. As your role in producing a photo documentary is to tell someone else's story in the most righteous and authentic way you can, regardless of your own personal beliefs and opinions. 4. Treat all subjects with respect and dignity. Give special consideration to vulnerable subjects and compassion to victims of crime or tragedy. Intrude on private moments of grief only when the public has an overriding and justifiable need to see. Subjects are human, just like you. They have emotions, fears, insecurities and phobias. Celebrate and appreciate their strengths as best you can and remember to do it for who they are. After all, it's about them, not your career or your portfolio. 5. While photographing subjects, do not intentionally contribute to, alter or seek to alter or influence events. Every event you witness has to be as authentic and honest as possible. You have to be a fly on the wall, a silent observer witnessing history unfold to then share what you saw with the world. 6. 
editing should maintain the integrity of the photogrammic images, content and context. Do not manipulate images or add or alter sound in any way that can mislead viewers or misrepresent subjects. That means doing absolutely no major photoshopping work to the images whatsoever, with no significant physical changes. The only tweaks you can probably get away with are very, very small light colour tweaks and light tweaks that you can maybe do in Lightroom that do no real harm in changing the narrative and storytelling of the photo. 7. Do not pay sources or subjects or reward them materially for information or participation. This is coercion and bribery. When information is shared for the sake of money or material, the authenticity of that information becomes questionable. As a result, this dangerously hampers the credibility of your work. And you don't want that, do you? 8. Do not accept gifts, favours or compensation from those who might seek to influence coverage. Your duty as a photojournalist is to tell the truth, and the truth must prevail. You cannot allow yourself to be bought, as the world is relying on you to know what is happening in it. Your authenticity matters, not just in your work, but in your character too. 9. Do not intentionally sabotage the efforts of other journalists. You're all there for the same purpose. It's much better to cooperate with others as opposed to getting in their way. After all, there is strength in numbers, especially when you work together. 10. Do not engage in harassing behaviour of colleagues, subordinates or subjects and maintain the highest standards of behaviour in all professional interactions. I'm pretty sure you can use your common sense with this one. As long as what you're photographing and documenting is raw, honest and respected, you're well on your way to being a credible photojournalist. And by now you're probably thinking, but I can't afford to travel! There is no interesting events happening around me. How the hell am I meant to know that these things are happening all across the world? But I've got your back, as there is a much more light-hearted, simpler alternative that absolutely anyone can do. Welcome to street photography, where instead of capturing worldly historic events, you're capturing everyday life and its artistic beauty. Because beyond photography, life is art because life is what we create for ourselves and make it a beautiful thing to live. If anything, street photography is what highlights the unique emotional moments that makes life stimulate our five senses, as if we're really there in that moment. The satisfaction of eating something tasty with someone you love or with an acquaintance after a long hard working day or holding someone close to you in such a way that their touch brings you comfort. It could also be something that makes you wonder about the smell of the scene, or lack of it. Perhaps the scene could look like there's something you can almost hear in your head. Or maybe it could just be the scene itself that you can't stop looking at, as it keeps making you wonder, think, or feel something. Some of my favourite street photos that I've shot today is this one, which I call the three stages of a relationship. Here on the left hand side you have two people that don't know each other, then in the middle you have two people deep in affection, and then on the right you have two people who look like they're having an intense argument. Three stages of a relationship, first you don't know each other, then you're deeply invested, but then afterwards you have the room and capacity to have more of the serious conversations. Next up, we got a real life mirror reflection. Here you can see two gentlemen sat in the same pose wearing a black jacket with a bag on the floor on the same side, even though they're sat on the same side of the bench. It almost looks like a real life mirror reflection. You also have a sign which says men's this way, pointing downwards to indicate that they're both men as well. Next up is this shot which I call Hopeless Romantic where here you can see this man walking at such a pace and his arm is out in such a fashion where it looks like he's touching that woman's elbow in hope that he's seen his next love interest. This photo here I call Bipolar and I'm pretty sure you can figure out why. Also sometimes in street photography it's not about the hitting moments or messages, sometimes it's just a great alignment or perfect timing, such as this. I'll be honest, I waited over a month to find the right billboard in order for me to get this shot you're seeing right here. This one here I call pushing up your spectacles. On the left you have a woman wearing a jacket where there's a picture of a woman pushing up her glasses and on the right hand side there is a woman doing exactly the same thing. In exactly the same angle too. This one, honestly I turned my head and I just saw this and I just couldn't believe my luck. 
Also, we got this shot, which I call Mannequin Mimicry. Personally, this is one of my favourite photos that I've ever shot of all time. She stood in front of the mannequins with the same hairstyle and her clothes are also the same colours as the mannequins behind her. And finally, we got this one, which I call Loved to Death. The reason why I call this Loved to Death is because the man is seen hugging his woman. His arm is around her neck. She is holding his arm with two hands, but the handle in front of them which is meant to symbolise a noose over the woman, is also meant to reflect on how she may feel. So when a man says that he loves his woman to death, you got the text on the right saying you're closer than you think, which shows that when a man is loving his woman so intensely and says that he loves her to death, he may be closer than he thinks when he says that. And also, as a bit of irony, you got on the left hand side the Wi-Fi symbol which insinuates a connection. So you learnt enough about street photography and photojournalism, you're sold, you're hooked in and you want to get in on the action. What camera do you need? Personally, I use a Sony Alpha on the 6000 series. You could go for the A7s too. I just never upgraded to full frame personally. But um, you can opt for one of these. You've also got great brands from Fuji and Leica and I think Nikon and Canon have some good ones too. The best lens to get would either be a 35mm 1.4 or a 16 to 35 f 2.8. The 35mm 1.4 is great for just general everyday street photography and the more calmer scenes where you can actually think about your shot. Whereas if you're in crowds and fast paced events, a 16 to 35mm would be better because you're able to zoom quick as opposed to changing lenses. And if you have a second camera on you, you could also opt for a 24 to 70mm. But if you only have one camera body, 16 to 35, and a 35 1.4, those are your two best lenses to go for street photography and photojournalism. Now, if you were starting out in street photography and you can't afford the 35mm or the 16 to 35 mil because granted they are very expensive lenses and lenses are no joke, you can start with the 50mm lens. The 50mm lens is also known as the Nifty 50 lens and it's called the Nifty 50 because it's the lens that is closest to what the human eye can see. So wherever you walk about, if you have the 50mm on you and you shoot things, it's pretty much similar to what you see in real life and what's happening right in front of you. So when you're doing street photography, you can also dub it as the Nifty 50 challenge where as you document things that are happening on the street, you are only armed with your 50mm lens and it's a nice way to challenge how you see things around you and how you can make the narrative of those photos as interesting as possible. I highly recommend every single photographer to try it, whether you're into street photography or not. Give the Nifty 50 challenge a go and see what you can capture. Now, if you're a little bit more traditional, you like to shoot with film, or you want to use a manual focus rangefinder lens, there is a technique you can use to get the best street photos very quickly. First of all, you want to set up the aperture. So you want to have it between 5.6, all the way up to 11 maybe, somewhere pretty high, so you have a nice deep depth of field. And then you want to keep the focus range very close to you. So if for example sakes, I set it up to around one foot, that way anything within one feet of me that may be interesting enough to happen, I've got the depth of field so that I can just photograph it. And whatever's happening within a one feet radius, I know I've got that in focus. But if something was happening outside that one foot radius and I need to get that in focus very quickly, all I can just do is just turn the focus to infinity very quickly as I point to shoot and then I just get the shot and I know that will be in frame and then I just turn it back to one foot. And it's easy because where I put my finger and thumb, it just takes one full rotation to lock to go back to that and then I rotate it back so that my thumb's on top and then that's my way of knowing without looking that I am back to one foot. And that's how you can get something close up to you and then go back far away and then back up top so it's like thumb close, index finger or lock far away and that's your way of knowing without actually having to look at the camera in risk of missing the scene at hand. It takes a bit of practice. 
I know I still need to practice this as well, but that's how the legends did it way back in the day and that's how you can do it today as well. Quick thing I forgot to mention is the best shooting settings for street photography. So for daylight, you definitely want your shutter speed very fast, up as from one of the 500th of a second. Aperture you want pretty deep as well, so you'd want to have it upwards from 5.6 upwards. Sometimes I have it at f8 depending on how sunny it is. And then you can use your ISO and work out the difference so that the shot looks presentable. In low light or at night, I have to shut the speed around about 1 over 250. The aperture I have around about f2.8, so more light can enter the scene. And the ISO, usually I have it around ISO 2000. But then again, I use the Sony a6300 personally. It really depends on the camera that you're using and what works best. But those are usually the settings that I use for low light street photography. Now, when you're settling into street photography and you're getting comfortable with what you're shooting and you want to start refining your photographs so that you can set it apart from all the rest and you have a unique interest and theme with your work. I call this thinking with your eyes. With street photography, it's all about thinking with your eyes, not with your head, because you can think and hypothesize various different things, but they may not actually happen. And it's so important to work with reality. And it's the only way how you can make your street photographies excellent. So when you are out taking street photos, you want to relay everything that is happening around you. Forget about thoughts, you're switching them all off. You're forgetting about life, you're only focusing on what's in front of you. So you're walking around, relaying everything happening to you and around you, you're looking for things, you're looking for patterns, you're looking for colours, you're looking for busyness. And you know, you can say like, oh, there's a graffiti over there, what does that say? It says this, okay. Could I make something happen with that? What's the likelihood of that happening? Nothing happening, no worries. Hang on, something caught my attention. What is that? Better go and investigate. What is happening? Is it interesting? Is it unique? Does it tell a story? Better snap it. It's a way of talking to yourself and you get so immersed with the reality, you pretty much forget about life. And that's probably the most therapeutic thing about street photography. You wanna think about juxtapositions. A juxtaposition is the fact of two things being seen or placed close together with a contrasting effect. Juxtapositions make some of the greatest shots in street photography. If you keep an eye out for those and see what you can find, you're bound to set yourself apart from the others. With street photography, be confident. If something intrigues you, shoot it. If it makes you stop and look, shoot it. If there's something interesting happening far away from you, run to it and shoot it. Do not have self-doubt, just get the shot. Every moment counts. You can review it later. If it works, great. But if not, well, you can just go back out in the streets and see if you can get some more. I want to make clear that there are certain things that you should avoid shooting and things that you should not photograph because whilst you may not be documenting people's stories in general day-to-day -day street photography, you are still photographing people's lives and people's lives are still somewhat personal and you have to do it with respect and out of courtesy to them. You want to still do these people justice by celebrating them in their unique moments as opposed to being intrusive and invasive on their lives. Some of the things that I'd firmly emphasize to people to not photograph would be homeless people, disadvantaged people, or people who are struggling or are in need of help. Another thing I'd say would be close-ups of strangers who are doing nothing interesting unprovoked. It's not really great street photography, you're just being invasive and it's not really cool. Try to go for something that's interesting that there may be happening there. Don't just do it for the sake of it and hoping like, oh yeah, let me get a quick photo close up of a stranger just walking by on their phone. Like, You can do better than that. Try to be challenging, try to go out of the norm, think outside the box. Don't go for common things that anyone can get. Go for the unique things that a lot of people will miss. Go for something that makes you feel something. But at the same time, don't be too intrusive, don't be too invasive, know how to keep the distance, but also try to get as close as you can, but be as invisible as you can. Finally, do not photograph children, especially if they're identifiable. Most cases, just aim to avoid it entirely. There may be some instances where, you know, the scene may seem mysterious or interesting you may feel something and you know what you can probably go ahead and shoot it and it may come out okay trust your instinct most times i'd avoid it just to be on the safe side now the thing with street photography is that 
you're photographing in an open public space. Legally, that's fine. You have the free will to do that. In this day and age especially, a lot of people are still kind of paranoid in being in public spaces. And that's something you have to be mindful of and respect. So if you feel like you're being watched and they feel uncomfortable around you as you're just like looking around with the camera and stuff, if there's a scene there and it involves the person that's noticing you, let the shot go. Just let the shot go. Enjoying street photography should not come at the expense of someone's sense of safety and comfort. Let the shot go, keep walking around, keep looking, because chances are you might find another moment right around the corner. Now let's say you're doing street photography, but someone happens to notice you and they get really offended by it and they start going all up in your business and start heckling you for it. Here's the best thing to do. First of all, be calm and remember that you're not doing anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing street photography, especially when you're adhering to the moral codes and the ethics. You're respecting people, you're not doing anything wrong. You're just out there looking for unique, interesting, wonderful moments to capture in day-to-day -day life. That's what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. If someone's giving you a hard time, it's likely that they are carrying their own burdens and they're not dealing with it very well. They may be projecting it onto you and it's more about them than yourself. So in a way, try to be understanding, be empathic, tell them you're sorry. If they ask you to delete the picture, just delete it. Let them see that you're deleting it and really do delete it. Don't lie to them because by lying to them, it just hurts them doubly and it makes you look nasty as a photographer and you don't want that. Another thing I want to mention is that street photography requires patience. And when I say patience, I mean serious, serious patience. It can take days for you to get the shot that you desire. And sometimes when you're waiting for days or even weeks or months to get that shot, it may not be the shot that you want and you have to be okay with that. Be patient with street photos. You can go out for a day and you can only get one good street photo, but if you get one good street photo, that is still a good day. When you go out for street photography, just aim to get one good photo. One fo good photo is all you need to make that photo walk worth it. And if you don't get a good photo, that's fine because there's always another day and there's always another moment around the corner. Now, if you have loved all the street photography and photojournalism that you have seen today and you want to look at more, I would strongly suggest looking at investing in some photo books dedicated to them or some websites that are, again, dedicated to the causes. I'll put together a list of some of the great street photography and photojournalism pages that I enjoy following and put them up over here. These are just some of my personal recommendations. Think about what you're looking at, see what you like and don't like, and follow whatever you gravitate towards at the end of the day. Finally, I just want to say it's been an absolute honor and a privilege to be here making this workshop for you guys. I just wanted to say thank you so much to the photo show for inviting me and having me on. This is a dream come true. And thank you to you guys as well for watching. I hope you guys have been able to take something from this and be able to implement it into your photography. And I hope it helps you see the way you look at the world a little bit differently and it makes you challenge yourself as well. So thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the photo show. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, watching. It's, uh, it's uh, very kind of you to uh, watch it. So uh, I'm just gonna cut straight to the taste and uh, let's look at some of these questions. So Jade Burrell asks me, what camera gear do I use? So I mentioned in the video that I use Sony a6300s, their crop sensor, and I use a Sigma 31.4 only because it's budget friendly. And I use um, the small crop sensor things because only, only literally because it's budget friendly. Like I struggled with finances whilst I was pursuing street photography because, you know, the income was never really that great. So I just stuck to what I could afford as opposed to like quality and stuff. But the thing with street photography is that, you know, it really it's, it's all about what you making the most of what you got, essentially. And, you know, how you see it and how you portray it, because there's no big like editing required. And it's just more about what's actually in the photo. The substance of your work is what's really key in order for your street photography to thrive. Moving on, um, if a subject is in danger, can you as a photojournalist intervene and help assist the subjects in the action you are trying to document? 
I mean, first and foremost, I am not a professional photojournalist. I'm a photojournalist enthusiast where I'm hopeful in my practicing of photography that I can eventually become a photojournalist and photograph the more dangerous scenes. I believe in humanizing your subjects. So if someone is in help, I wouldn't stand there and photograph it. I would go out and help them. Um, it really is a difficult question to ask in context. It really does depend on the scene at hand. But for the most part, I would obviously go out my way to help people because if you just don't help them and you don't make a difference and help people live, you know, you can kind of just work that one out for yourself. Uh, let's see the next one. Peter, how do, I, how do I pronounce that? Wormsley? Peter Wormsley says, to what extent should the rules of photojournalism apply to street photography? I would say the full extent. Um, I am a firm believer in always playing it safe and, um, you know, being respectful to people and celebrating people as well, because a, a, a common trope that a lot of photographers do is they make photography all about themselves and you never want to fall into that. Because the minute you start making your photography all about you, then, you know, you kind of be like, yeah, it's all about me, blah, blah, blah. And it creates a really big ego that can actually work against you. You don't want that. So, you know, you always want to be respectful of people and consider about what people may be going through, if they have any insecurity or whatever. And the main core thing you've got to remember is that when you are out documenting people doing things or street life or whatever, you want to do it in the best way you can so that, you know, people are worth noticing, acknowledging and celebrating because end of the day, people want to be seen and recognized. And that's what you're trying to do with your work. Uh, Mark Lanyon says, you say the 50 mil lens is closest to the eye you can see in the world, but it's just on a crop sensor and a full frame sensor. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I use uh, crop sensors and I have a crop sensor 50 mil on a crop sensor sensor. Yeah. And then obviously if you have a full frame camera, then you put a 50 mil full frame lens on that camera body as well. So as long as the sensor matches the corresponding lens size thing, then you're pretty much good to go. I love street photography photos, and this is from Alexia Chapman, uh, conscious of photos of other people. Any tips on this? Learn how to be a people's person. Um, this goes way outside photography and more into psychology, which is another area which I'm really interested in. Um, by the way, if you guys uh, want to learn more about street photography, psychology, art, and how all the things are interlinked, I have a YouTube channel as well if you want to subscribe. Faisal Tracia, um, I'm sure all the details are around here somewhere. Uh, but yeah, in terms of being conscious on taking photos of other people, it's learn how to be comfortable with talking to people and people you don't know. It sounds really strange. Practice talking to yourself in front of a mirror because and, and do this a lot every single day. It should be like regular practice because if you're comfortable looking at yourself and talking and how you look when you're talking, you become so familiar with yourself that you can't let yourself be shaken. But uh, if you know how to, and yeah, when you are so comfortable with yourself, you don't worry about what people are thinking of you. You care about what you have to express and share out. And if what you are sharing is of good intentions and it comes from a good place, then you really have nothing to worry about. And if anyone reacts nasty to you, it says more about them than you. And as long as you remember that very well, which can be difficult in the given moment, as long as you remember that, you should be okay. Because, you know, end of the day, like, it really does depend on how well you take things personally. But, you know, not everyone is bad. It's just some people are just going through bad things and it sucks. But, you know, that's life. And we just try to make the most out of a bad situation. At least that's what I do anyway. I hope that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of questions. I didn't expect so many questions. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Gary. What do I think about so-called audit photo... Um, audit photojournalism? I say that too much. Audit journalism. I have no idea what that is. I'm going to be very honest with you. But I think journalism, again, really matters about the story and not agendas. And my opinions on journalism are a little bit questionable. So I'm not going to go into that. But... Um, Again, it, it, it all about, it's, it's all about the story being told and where it comes from and for it to come from a good place. Um, great workshop, thanks. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Barry. Uh, what are your takes on creating the perfect moment for a photograph? Be attentive and be present. Forget about technologies, forget about being on your phone. Really 
connect with the environment and what's happening around you so like you know talk to yourself in your head being like there's a person walking by what is he wearing he's wearing this ask yourself questions and then answer those questions that you've asked yourself because it connects it wakes up your mind and it it also can the mind body connection it helps you cement that as well so that you're more agile you feel more alive and present and you're really going out there making the most with um <coughs> oh god i choked on my own spit <laughs> sorry um it just makes you really more aware of what's going on what did i do with the photos of the car on fire were you able to do something with them i put them on my website on a blog on my instagram page and that was it at the moment um as much as i love uh street photography and photojournalism, I haven't really found a way of me getting them published and stuff, only because I'm so naive to it all, and I think I'm just so caught up in just shooting the things, that, um... <laughs> I'm sorry, I just watched myself choke. Uh, yeah, like, I've never really found a way to, like, properly get the photography out there, but it's not really that much of a concern to me. I just like making things. I, I try to keep it simple for myself, I just like making things, that kind of make me feel validated and make me feel like I'm fulfilling a purpose that found me and just going out there and seeing life in a unique perspective because that's what I love about street photography it allows you to do that. Dina Chowdhury asks how do you sustain yourself as a street photographer? You don't. Uh, you have a side job, uh, you have a full-time job and you always keep your camera on you and you dedicate an hour to like exploring, wandering around, making up as you go along, capturing what you see. Sometimes you get things, sometimes you don't, a lot of the times you don't, but the main core reason why you do your artwork is because I believe art is a therapy. Street photography is certainly my therapy. I do it to relax and switch off and forget about the chaotic world and more observe it instead. And it's the perfect medium for it. Uh, William Griffiths asked, do I mainly use colour or black and white? So I don't shoot film a lot, mainly because it's expensive and I try to do the best I can on a budget. I honestly use colour a lot, but I don't object to black and white. It's just more, I think I save black and white film photography for the more special moments, if you know what I mean. Oliver May asks, most street photography seems to take place in large and busy cities. Do you have any tips for those, those of us living in smaller towns and villages? So you can do street photography wherever you want it really doesn't matter about busyness busyness just increases your chances but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen in smaller cities as well you have to be so comfortable walking around with nothing happening go out just go out walk explore keep your mind open and blank and let things come to you don't do any thinking just let everything work around you otherwise travel a bit go around to different places different cities it not only lets you see the world but you also get to find more different scenes happening around the world. It's, um, you know, you can really make something of yourself. But um, yeah, I, I think that's just all I've got to say on that one. Do you prefer the Bruce Gilden style in your face street photography or more standoff style? Right, I was hoping someone would ask this one because I'm very familiar with Bruce Gilden. Personally, I like his work, but I don't think anyone should replicate it because it is invasive and you know, we, we've got to consider that when Bruce Gilden was doing his street photography, it was way back in the day when social media wasn't a thing. And more people were more focused on their lives and just going about their day. And I don't think people were that caring. And I think they had different priorities in life. But now that social media has come into play and, you know, there's a really big awareness of things, of, you know, scary things, concerning things, you know, it's really changed the way how we think and behave. And... I think a lot of people nowadays are living a lot more in fear. So because a lot more people are living in fear because, you know, who's taking this? Are they doing it for like good means or bad means? Are they taking a photo of me? Are they posting it on a social media account? Like a lot of people are living in fear. It's not a very healthy way to live. And it's sad that we live in this state at the moment. So the Bruce Gilden style is, I, I, I would say the best way to put it is that it should only be for Bruce Gilden because he's the only one who's made it into something. No one else is gonna have that success. It's not really worth the risk because I've seen posts and stuff on like Reddit and other various websites where um, people have gotten into legal trouble and have have it be taken way too far out of context. And, you know, it's kind of sad when someone's kind of like doing something innocently and they it gets misconstrued into something like that. And I just don't want anyone to get under that risk. So I'd say avoid it just to be on the safe side. Um, 
quite often street subjects will engage with you and that changes the picture sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't yeah i mean i personally don't like it when people look at the camera i don't i'm not really a fan of those kind of images uh i don't really like to post those but sometimes they can make something interesting happen just depends on the photo at hand toyin odoshi asked me has anyone ever asked you to delete the photo yes they have they haven't really been nice about it but um when someone has deleted or, or when someone has asked me to delete the photo interestingly enough it was the most least troubling photo ever like i took i took a photo of someone's hand holding a chair and this guy came across long and he was just like excuse me can you delete that now please and i'm just like it's just a photo of your hand dude but it's just like i don't care delete it now and so i just deleted it i just deleted it just to make him feel better but i mean like again it's that whole thing of paranoia and people living in fear because people don't know what people are doing and you know it's just living in fear is so exhausting and i wish people kind of just chilled out a little bit but then at the same time that's just wishful thinking uh i'm just reading some of the questions philippa robertson you enjoy street photography yeah that's true you do strike up conversations and it's fantastic um thank you guys very much for your kind words do i have a preferred aspect ratio for your street photography just go for the biggest you can honestly because the more you can get in that frame the better and i also try to not crop as well i try to keep it true to the original shot um yeah i mean i'd always go for as big as i can just to because the more you get in one shot the better do i carry a business card to prove my good intentions or offer my subjects a copy honestly no i don't um one because it's costly and i've developed a habit because I, I struggled for a long time financially right so i always I've, I've developed a habit of penny pinching carrying a business card does sound like a good idea but the thing is when people are offended or taken aback that it's they will be blinded by anger and it's, it'll be very difficult for them to kind of listen to reason at least that's what i fear and that's what i anticipate maybe it's a good practice um it might be a good idea for me to keep that on the safe side but i wouldn't say it's the biggest importance because um i guess with london especially people are so busy in the hub hub in the hubbub sorry to go from a to b to c to d that they're not really paying attention to what's going on around them um i mean it's a great idea i don't oppose it i just never practiced it cool i mean um i've just been told that my time is up um oh man there's so many great questions i wish i could answer them all but um guys thank you all so much for watching you can find me on instagram and on youtube as well um Faisal Trey Shah be sure to follow but I was just going to say thank you guys so much for watching tuning in thank you for all your amazing questions and uh, I hope you guys have a splendid day and weekend thank you guys so much for watching have a good day